Guys, welcome back to another really exciting video here. I'm super stoked on this one because I've made this fantastic looking enclosure that I'm super, super proud of. And it's all for a couple of little geckos. And these guys here, they are some Strophorus ciliaris aberrans. Welcome to Beaches Scaly Beasts, where I focus on the natural keeping of herptofauna and marine aquaria. Let's dive straight into this video because it's a bit of an in-depth one and I'm going to show you how I put this thing together. So before I do actually show you how I ended up putting all of this gear in here and making it look like this awesome little piece of nature, I do have a little bit of housekeeping to go through on. And guys, if you are enjoying the content that I am putting out there, I'm asking for a little bit of support. Only if you do want to, of course, but I have a couple of little options. So if you do want to support the channel, you can go and check out Patreon. I'd really appreciate it if I had a few guys jump on there because all the money that I earn off Patreon goes straight back into keeping my animals here it you know, gives me a little bit of inspiration, it goes into enclosures, it goes into food, electricity and a whole bunch of other things as well. It is really time consuming putting these videos together. So you know, I do spend a lot of my own time putting all of this gear together for you guys. So that's one option. The second option that you could check out is getting some awesome merch from my Teespring store. I've got a few different Aussie reptile stuff up there, different t-shirts, bits and pieces and stuff like that. And I'm going to be putting some more gear out on there too. And I'll make sure to put all the links and stuff, not only down in the description, but also down on the screen here. So if you do want to check it out and support, man, that'd be great. I do have a few people I need to thank before diving into this video as well. So first off the rank, I'm going to thank Jerry from Get Your Pet Right. He supplied this awesome UVB T5 tube up here to keep these guys nice, happy and healthy. Uh, man, he's brought out an awesome range of T5 light units. I'll put a little photo up here somewhere as well. you got to try these things out, hey? Like, you know... He, Granted, he did give this unit to me, but you know, it is absolutely cranking along here. I've been testing it out for about a week or so now, and these animals seem to really love it. You know, they're just getting right up underneath there and basking under it, and uh, yeah, they seem to be really, really happy with it. I'll show it a little bit more in detail later on as well, but it's a little bit different to most other T5 units that are getting about out there as well. I have to give Corey from Fish Organics and Reptile Supplies a big shout out as well. He supplied me with more of his awesome bioactive kits, you know, if you're, in, uh, if you're in Australia, you guys need to contact your pet shops and see if you can get these things in if you're interested in them. Because, man, he's absolutely pumping through. I might have to wait a little while to actually get these kits sent up to me because he's actually selling out that quickly with them. So they've become a really popular item Australia-wide. And if your pet shop's not carrying them, well, you should probably tell them to. I also have to give Cam from Cam's Custom Backgrounds a big shout out as well. He helped me put this whole thing together. He kind of gave me a bit of a guideline of how to put all the background and bits and pieces together. I did throw my own flares and stuff on there, which you'll see throughout the video as well compared to his vids. But, you know, even just pointing me in the right direction as far as some of the, the product and stuff goes, you know, he was absolutely fantastic for that. And if you haven't seen his YouTube channel out there, make sure you go and check that out as well. He puts up awesome videos on how to build certain backgrounds and stuff like that. And I can definitely see myself using nothing but his method pretty much going forward. And it's already given me so many more ideas of how I want to improve some backgrounds here and, you know, make things really unique. So the person that I do want to thank the most is none other than Rick Worthy himself from Worthy Geckos. Now, Rick hands down has been such a mentor for me throughout this hobby, you know, I've been bugging him with questions for years now and I've bought countless animals off him. Uh, his knowledge is just phenomenal and if you are in Australia and you are looking for Australian geckos, I don't think you can pass this guy up because he is seriously what I'd consider and in my opinion the best gecko breeder in Australia. The numbers that he produces and that he's nailed down on so many species and so many species of Australian geckos that he's actually kind of brought into the hobby and helped kind of establish and get serious numbers up. Like, the guy's just a machine. Like, you just can't go past a good breeder like that. So, I honestly can't plug him enough. He threw a challenge my way and, you know, I decided to accept him on the challenge. He, t he turned around to me and he said, can you do an arid bioactive setup? And I simply said, I don't know, but I'm willing to try. So I've never been into really arid sort of bioactive setups with more, uh, 
desert animals and, you know, dry animals. So Rick turned around to me and said, well, I've got a pair of aberrants here, and if you want them, you can take them, but you need to be able to prove to me that you can do an arid setup and see if how we go with it. So it is a bit of a trial. There's no lying about that. You know, and obviously this setup's only pretty new. It's only a couple, well, about a week old now. So it's very, very fresh and very, very in its infancy. But so far, so good. Hopefully I'm gonna do it justice. And uh, it is something that I'm definitely gonna do a lot more of because after producing this with the awesome background and everything in here, man, I just, it's awesome. Like I just can't get enough of it. I, I find myself staring in here all the time. Rick's absolutely killing it with the ciliaris and you know, he's got Northern spinies coming out his ears and stuff at the moment. So if you guys are in the market for any Australian gecko that he does, in particular, some stroughs like these guys, you gotta go and hit him up. He's got this awesome Facebook page. He's actually got a couple of them. He's got his main kind of page there, which is Worthy Geckos. And he's also got his Worthy Geckos available page. So that's where he'll pop up any animals that he does have available. And if you're lucky and you need something in particular, you might be able to shoot him a message and see if you could twist his arm on a different species as well. Yeah, as I said, guys, if you're into Australian geckos, even if you are from overseas and you just want to see awesome Australian geckos, go and give his Facebook page a like and give the guy a bit of support because he's absolutely nailing it. You know, <laughs> he's done so well this year. I can't remember the number that of geckos that he said that he'd produced, but it was somewhere up <laughs> towards like the 700 mark or thereabouts. So he's absolutely got them coming out of the wazoo and they are quality geckos. I've never had a gecko from him that I've found that was, you know, underweight or anything like that these things are just always awesome you know you get solid hatches from him if you are buying hatchlings you know they're never just like fresh out of the egg and you know see you later sort of thing so i've always felt very secure buying geckos off rick so here you are guys here's a bit of a closer look at these gorgeous little geckos you will get a few more close-ups don't you worry i just thought i'd give you a little sneak peek of what this habitat looks like just before we go straight into the build give you a little bit of inspiration so these guys are day basking geckos. These guys imitate the little branches that they stick on and you can see they're a little bit hard to see and if you can't see them, got the little girls just up here and the male is just on this branch over here. They're fantastic looking little animals. The male's got a little bit of dark patterning through him and a bit of orange speckling and stuff through his tail and his, uh, his body and the female's not too dissimilar. These guys have awesome little orange kind of colored eyes, a little bit of red flecking and things through there. Oh, it's one thing that I always get with geckos is just their eyes just always look fantastic. They're so unique, species to species. So as I said earlier, these guys come from arid parts of Australia. Different types of Strophora species are found all the way across the interior. And these particular species, the Strophora ciliaris aberrans, they're found predominantly in WA, but there have been records of them over in the Northern Territory as well, generally on the Western side of the Northern Territory. And actually some records have been down around Alice Springs as well, just where I was not too long ago, herping around there in the bush. Unfortunately, I didn't see any stroughs while I was out there. I was a little bit disappointed because they're one animal that I really wanted to see. Uh, but, you know, it was pretty hot when I was there. We were there, you know, end of summer essentially, and most days were above 35, so it was probably a little bit unlikely to actually see these guys out and active until probably like the wee hours of the morning where, you know, I was very tired and these guys may have been really awake. I even went to one spot that Danny Brown mentions in his book, uh, the uh, Undula station in Alice Springs or Undula station in Alice Springs. I was hanging around there for a couple of nights trying to see if I could find these guys because they do mention that the aberrants was actually found near that station. Now whether it was actually them or it was just a northern spiny tail gecko that was mistaken for an aberrants I'm not a hundred percent certain of course but it was cool nonetheless to kind of hunt around in some way that I've seen in a book and I read in a book for an animal that I loved for so many years. It's definitely given me the drive to want to go back to nail this species as well as a couple of others. <coughs> Cough, Gil and I. <coughs> but you know, these guys are absolute awesome captives. Pretty much feeding on insects the entire time. Little medium crickets is what I've been feeding these guys and some smaller kind of small to medium wood roaches as well. Uh, during the day, I have seen them actually hiding down in that plant off the right hand side as well. And if they're not doing that, they're up on these little branches. So I'll throw up a few shots here of where I was looking for them in the wild. There was very similar habitat to what I tried to replicate here, probably minus the background. You know, it was more shrubbery and stuff like that, low hanging trees and this kind of spindly wood. 
generally associated with different types of mulgers and acacias. But when I was looking for these guys in the west and east max, I wanted to kind of replicate the rock work for the background that I did find in the area too. And a lot of that was this really harsh kind of granite crushed looking stuff that was all stacked up and jagged. I'll throw up a couple of photos of where I drew the inspiration for this enclosure from. You can kind of see where I was hunting around looking for looking for these guys, but you know, probably more likely looking for ciliara ciliaras. But yeah, you can kind of just get a bit of a picture about where I was actually looking for these guys. All right guys, well without any further ado, let's hop into this build because it's gonna be a bit of a long one. I think the actual build process video section of it is about 20 minutes or 23 minutes or something like that. So it's gonna be a long one. Make yourself a coffee, sit back and relax and I hope this inspires you to do something similar. To start out this build, we obviously need an enclosure and what a better way to start than a brand new 45 centimeter cube exoterra enclosure. I really honestly dig these enclosures. I think the only downfall is I wish they did a somewhat more durable mesh. And maybe if they came with a bit of a better background, then that might be a good option as well. So here you can see that I'm actually lining up the insulation foam, getting ready to cut it into a few different sizes. And this is just basically for the first layer that's gonna go around the three walls of the inside of the enclosure. This insulation foam can be bought just from most Bunnings. I believe it's the Knopf brand or Knauf. I can never say that right. Um, and I believe it's uh, about 45 mil thick. So this stuff's super, super tough. If you've ever touched it, it's honestly a really, really strong board. It's, um, it's not spongy like expanding foam or other insulation foams. It is quite durable. So it does take a little bit to kind of cut through it. I'm just using a razor blade to score an edge in it just so I can snap the boards really easily. It's not what I'd recommend long term to actually cut the whole thing with though. Yeah, it's going to stand up for the, for the lifetime of the enclosure, you know, it's very, very durable. So right now you can see that I'm actually siliconing these into place. I'm not using any special silicon for this because the animals aren't going to come in contact with it at all. And as you can see, it's not super pretty, but we will cover that up later, so don't worry about that. I'm being pretty liberal with the silicon as well. You can see that I'm using a couple of different colors, a couple of different tubes. It's not gonna make a difference whatsoever. All I need to do is make sure that this stuff sticks to the walls. These first three foam boards will just kind of lay a foundation for us to build out the rest of our rockscape on. It's a good idea to really push these foam boards with the silicon on them right in just so you get a good uh, amount of surface area adhering the boards to the walls. So now here comes the fun part. I'm starting to play with a few different shapes and this kind of rockscape as well is going to be going off some pretty similar rockscapes that I found in some of the gorges in the West McDonald Ranges and the East McDonald Ranges. And uh, yeah, you know, they were kind of made up with a lot of cracks and things. So that's why I'm going to use a lot of these offcuts and different shape pieces just to kind of really box some stuff up. Something you will find that I'm actually making on the left hand side of the enclosure there is a little nest box for these animals so they can actually dig down and deposit their eggs in there. Whether they actually use it or not, or they use some of the loose uh, deep substrate around where the nest box is going to go, I'm not 100% certain. But it'll be good nonetheless just to give them the option. Plus, you know, it kind of just plays into a bit of creativity and, you know, gets the, the brain juices flowing and see how we can make some different shapes and things on there. So the next stage is to really start carving out some of this foam and make it a hell of a lot easier. I picked up one of these foam cutters off eBay. I think it cost me maybe 30, 32 bucks or something like that. And I have to say, I reckon this is gonna be a really good favorite tool in the arsenal to have. Came with a whole bunch of different attachments for some different sort of shapes and bits and pieces. And uh, yeah, I can definitely see me creating a lot more foam backgrounds with this thing. It just makes it super easy and you don't have all the dust and stuff getting around. This is probably my favorite attachment. It's a thin little wire that gets super hot and just absolutely flakes apart this foam. And like, I say this foam's tough, I mean it's actually tough. So this is a really cool tool just to kind of have, you know, cut out little sections and put a lot of detail into the rock work. The 
one benefit of using this foam cutter over something like one of the wire wheels or something that I've used in the past is you just don't have the same sort of mess. You know, everything just flakes off. It's really easy to bend up. There's no dust everywhere. There's no sort of having to wear a respirator while you're doing it. I probably would recommend wearing some sort of face mask uh, or, you know, some sort of gas mask of some description or even just cutting it outside just because there is a little bit of an odor that comes off this, which I'm sure is not that great for you. I had an absolute ball using this tool and especially getting some of these horizontal textures and stuff through this enclosure, man, it made it easy. I took out one of the other deeper bits that actually kind of, you know, burns a bit more of a, almost like a soldering iron, I suppose you could say. And I just went back over the enclosure and hit some real deep spots and created a few more trenches in between a few of these gaps. Here you can have a bit of a good look at what the enclosure looks like after I finish carving. And you can also see a little bit more of that little nest box rock thing that I've created in the left hand corner there. I reckon this is going to be quite cool and yeah, really looking forward to seeing whether the actual animals use it in the future. So the next job is actually to start painting on some of this hard coating tile pointing. Cam from Cam's Custom Backgrounds actually put me onto this product and to be honest it's a pretty cheap product for what it is. And I think it's about $38 for a 10 litre bucket and I think in total I used about a third of the bucket on this enclosure. You can see here that I'm actually watering down the, the tile pointing for the first layer and this is just to kind of get a bit of a priming layer onto the actual enclosure. It doesn't really look like much once this layer goes on but it just gives it something for the further layers to actually adhere to. So I gave that about 12 hours or so to really dry off and then I started on the second layer to go over the top of that first original layer. As you can see, it's a lot heavier of a mix. It's pretty much almost a straight coat straight from the tub. I did add a little bit of water to it and something else that I did add to it is a bit of red brick oxide. This just really pumps in that red colour that I'm going for, you know, very much replicates where I was at in the Northern Territory and that kind of red Kimberley slash, you know, Northern Territory, Red Escarpment Country. So using an old brush, I really made sure just to pump this stuff straight over every little nook and cranny inside this enclosure. Just really making sure to hit everything and hit it hard. You know, we can kind of carve out a bit of that detail later, which I'll show you, but I just wanted to make sure that we got a nice good layer over the top of that original priming layer. Something else you may have noticed and I failed to mention previously is that I've really made a good effort to tape up any of the black plastic on the enclosure. 
This stuff really does get stuck onto any sort of plastic and it would be a nightmare to actually get it off all of those black trims on this Exoterra. It's another reason why I'm wearing gloves is just because it's such a messy task and it does get everywhere. So it just made it super easy just to keep everything clean with a bit of personal protective equipment. So here's the first look after the first real solid coat of that red tile pointing's gone onto the enclosure. I reckon it's already starting to look great and you can start seeing a bit of that detail work coming through. I don't actually mind that there's a few little dags here and there because in nature, you know, rocks aren't always perfectly smooth and uniform. I actually like the kind of rough texture that's on this enclosure. Now all I'm doing here is I'm just taking a dry brush just to kind of go over and smooth out a few of those bigger points. You know, I'm not going to take off everything, but at the end of the day, you know, if there's something that's really big and obvious, then I don't want that sticking on there forever. One of the best tools I actually used was the back end of this spoon. It just made it really easy to get right into those real deep cracks and just kind of hollow out a bit of the tile pointing that I didn't need in there. Of course, I needed to pack it in there just to make sure that the actual product was in there, but you can kind of just carve out that remaining bit of detail that you need just with the back end of a spoon. You could even use like a butter knife or something similar to that, but yeah, it just made it easy to kind of go over everything and just carve that detail out. As you can see, I really spent my time going over this enclosure with the spoon, getting all that detail out. And that's just because, you know, you put the hard work into carving the foam and you don't want to lose that at the end product. Here comes coat number three. Whilst this method definitely does take a bit of time and a bit of patience to get through, it honestly, out of every enclosure build that I've done and every background I've done, it has turned out by far the best. And it's certainly something that I'm going to be replicating in the future and a lot more enclosures to come. And I've already got so many ideas in my head about what I want to do next. So I didn't bother filming the fourth layer that I put on there because I figured you kind of got the point. But here you can actually see that I'm using some acrylic paints just to kind of knock up some highlights on the actual edges of all of the rock work. I think I went a little bit heavy handed on this highlighting to be honest, so I did go back over and fix a few things up. Now, one thing that I did do next was I actually used a little bit of a black acrylic paint, really watered down in a spray bottle, and this was just to kind of weather the rock work. I did have to have a play around in the end just to kind of see how much paint to how much water I really found that you know worked out to the best of the ability on the actual red kind of background. And it did take a little bit of figuring out, but once we got there, it ended up with a pretty cool result. So once all that black wash had actually dried off, I ended up going over all that edging that I had put on there with the highlight and just kind of dulling it down a bit so it was less obvious. It was just a little bit too intense for my liking and just looked like somebody had kind of hit it with a bunch of lines that just looked really unnatural. 
So I just made sure to go back over it. Again, with just a little bit of that color with the same sort of oxide and just kind of take a little bit of it out. Not all of it, but just take that little kind of sharpness off the edges. And now I'm going over the enclosure background and just kind of picking out all the detail, all those cracks, all those little nooks and crannies where, you know, the shadows of, of the lights and things would get into naturally. And I'm putting that dark brown slash black kind of paint into it. I didn't really have like a solid color mixed up. I was kind of just kind of packing it in where I could and just seeing how it kind of turned out. It was a little bit messy and, you know, it did kind of hit a few spots that were raised, but it was really worth doing because it really does make it pop. It's not too hard to kind of go back over those raised edges and just hit them again with that sort of uh, red oxide paint that I was mixing up earlier and just kind of take the edges off it. I certainly think this was the smartest move as far as paint colour is concerned. It really made the enclosure come to life. I actually found that the blacks in the black wash just didn't come up dark enough for my liking and when you're actually in these areas where this habitat is you can actually notice how much how much black is on these rocks how weathered it actually is so i started using a bit of a sponge brush just to kind of really dry brush over some of the highlighted areas and just kind of weather them down even further and this was just using that same color that i had before but just using it a bit of a dry brush technique as you can see it really works quite well just to bring another highlight to it You've got those lighter tones, those red tones, those real dark shadows, and then you've got that weathering black on top of it. It really just made this enclosure pop. It just makes it look fantastic. Oh, you know, it, I was pretty chuffed with myself with this one. It's something that I'm really, really proud of. Well, I did tell you that I was gonna be blacking out these sides so you don't see any of that ugly foam and silicon. And I just did it simply using some uh, black vinyl laminate. It's super simple to put on. You just kind of whack it on like a bit of car tin, a little bit of lubrication with some water, razor blade just to trim it up, and a credit card or something similar just to kind of squidgy all the air bubbles and water out. So now it's time to light this bad boy up and get your pet right to come to the table with this awesome Forest 7% UBB T5 unit. This is a nice little 30 centimeter T5 unit. You guys know that I'm a fan of my T5s. And look how sleek this looks. It's all in a nice black color too. None of that silver trim on top. Such a nice little unit. Absolutely perfect for little geckos and frogs. As far as actually lighting the plants on this enclosure, I just went for some simple down lights. I know it's a little bit uh, janky, so to speak, but these little down lights, I'm able to put four on top of this enclosure, get a really good light spread. They do have the option for 6,500 Kelvin on them. They're pretty cheap. So I'm just having a bit of a play around. I might look at uh, trading out these for some different LEDs down the line, but for now, they should be enough. So this is what I'm gonna use for a mix of substrate. I'm gonna do a couple of different layers too. And you see I've got some red sand, some brown crushed granite. I've got the fire clay balls for the drainage layer and coir peat and leaf litter all from Fish Organics. And through the main uh, layer, I'm also gonna be mixing in some of this organic potting mix, just to really give the plant something else to give them a bit of nutrients. But as I said, we are gonna mix it with a few other things. So here you can see I'm using some of the organic potting mix, a whole bag of that coir peat from Fish Organics and Reptile Supplies. Uh, we're also gonna put a whole bunch of this brown crushed granite through here. And this is just to try to aim, you know, a bit more for a sandy loamy soil, but still nutrient rich. And this is so it could drain very well. So now I'm mixing up the capping layer and this is just basically red sand and some crushed granite, just to give it a bit of texture. I'm also gonna mix up the nest box substrate and that's just a bit of red sand and the coir peat. Now comes the fun part, plants. So here I'm using a myoporum, which is basically just a little native uh, ground cover plant. And I'm also gonna be using a type of grevillea in this enclosure as well. Both of these, you can see I'm throwing the Latin up there that was on the pots that they came in, but both of these were okay in part shade according to the tags, so I figured why not give them a crack. One of the most important things you can do when making any bioactive terrarium is just to make sure that you really rinse out the roots on these plants. You just don't want any fertilizers or anything getting into the enclosure. So I'm not mucking around now. It's time to get all this drainage layer into place. And you can actually see that little drain pipe over near the nest box too. 
if it gets too full of water or anything, I can actually drain it out. Or I can also use it to put water into the base of the terrarium. The fly screen goes over the top of these clay drainage balls just to make sure that none of the dirt actually gets into the drainage area. And you can see I'm being pretty liberal with that as well. And that's basically just because I don't want anything getting into that layer. From there, it's pretty easy. I'm just chucking a whole bunch of this kind of drainage level uh, soil in there, that soil mixture that I made with the organic potting mix. And I'm also putting in the nesting material into that nest box. So as the grevillea is actually gonna be the larger of the two plants going in here, I figured I'd put it into that back corner and give it that kind of deeper substrate area to grow in. As the myoporum is a ground cover plant, I figured it would make most sense to put this in the bottom front left hand corner. So now comes the fun part of putting in this capping layer. This layer consists of that red desert sand and that crushed granite. And that crushed granite really gives it a clay-like texture, which is pretty normal in the Australian bush. I really take my time with this and make sure to get it under all of the plants and into every nook and cranny. So these little geckos love to sit in these thin little branches and imitate actual branches. So that's what I'm gonna put in here, just a ton of little woodwork. And this is the kind of stuff that you actually see out in the bush and especially where they're kind of found and the sort of shrubbery and things that they're found in. It's just to really stimulate natural behaviors. Any sort of wood that I end up taking from the bush, I pretty much bring home and sit on top of my turtle pond in the sun for a couple of weeks before I use it. Thereabouts, you know, especially if it's got loose bark or anything like that on it. It's just a way that I try to, you know, kind of draw any bugs out of it. Uh, little thin things like this, you know, you can physically see that there's not really anything on there, but some larger pieces I might actually hit with a bit of mite spray or something like that just to try to kill anything that might potentially be on there. That's a pretty good all round uh, insecticide. You can see here that, you know, the branches are a little bit too big for the enclosure, so I'm actually just trimming them just by snapping the little twigs off. And I'm actually just gonna throw those down onto the surface of the soil there as well. And it just makes another good little layer to add to the leaf litter. It'll be going in here shortly. So here we go, putting some of this leaf litter in with this enclosure. This stuff straight from Corey at Fish Organics. Man, you guys have to get onto your local pet shops if you want these bioactive kits in store there. I know he's selling them uh, really well in South Australia, Victoria, and in Queensland. But in saying that, I think Sydney and New South Wales could use them a little bit more. You can see there that I just used the water bowl just to cover up that drainage pipe. Just an easy way to kind of cover it up. Um, and yeah, it's a good way to kind of hide the water bowl a little bit too, so it's less of an eyesore inside of the enclosure. Last but not least, we need to add some bugs. So these little guys were just harvested out of my garden. I haven't had a chance to actually breed these guys as of yet. These are the larger variety of slaters that kind of ball up really well in a ball. And uh, yeah, hopefully these guys last in this more arid environment, but I'm gonna see how these guys go. So after all the slaters are added in, I'll then add in some springtails.
So this brings the build process to an end. I hope you really enjoyed the video. And if you did, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe on it. And I'll leave you guys with a few shots of the Aberrans. I'll see you all on the next build.